Our next speaker is Mateusz Dymiński. He is working at Nokia and on a daily basis he builds scalable distributed systems in a cloud environment. Please welcome on stage Mateusz Dymiński with his lecture Diagnose your Golang app anytime, anywhere. Diagnose your Golang uptime anytime, anywhere, Mateusz Dymiński. Okay, <coughs> hello everyone. So, um, my name is Mateusz Dymiński and today I would like to talk about uh, diagnosing uh, Golang applications and uh, if you don't know Go, uh, you shouldn't be worried because all the examples are pretty straightforward. Um, and I mainly focus on um, on tooling, so some really nice tools all around the Go, which might help us to uh, find the problem and also improve the speed of our applications. So let's go. Uh, about me, uh, as I've got ready, uh, have a uh, introduction, but I came from the J Java world, uh, then switched to Go, and uh, in the meantime, I'm organizing the Go Wrocław, which is a Golang meetup here in Wrocław. So uh, please be invited. Uh, you can find me on uh, GitHub, Twitter, and LinkedIn as well. So if you have any questions, also if you would like to find the slides and all the examples which I'm going to show today, please visit this. Um, this page, okay, so um, the PPTX uh, document, uh, slides, code examples, everything is there. It's already uh, been there for for some time, so um, so if you would like to have some and make some photos of, of the slides, so uh, I guess it's better to just visit this, um, this page. So let's go. Uh, about the agenda, so I've split it, my, my uh, presentations into three things and three uh, parts. So the first and the, the place where we start is debugging, then profiling, and at the very end, tracing. So all those three things might help us with find a problem, okay? Sometimes it's a performance problem, so the profiling and tracing might, uh, might help us to find uh, a bottleneck in our applications and improve it. I will do that. Uh, during the, the the demos, which I'm going to show you, and the first part, the debugging part, is uh, focused on um, on finding the problem with the logic. Okay, so if we've got some some of course some bad things in the code and so wrong path, wrong if, wrong for anything, then debugging might happen, might help, of course. And debugging, of course, the the definition is pretty straightforward. So let's go uh, to that. Um, it just allows us to pause uh, a program and then examine its execution. Yeah, so we can check what is going on, what are the the state of variables, uh, what's the flow, where we are going to do next, and so on. Pretty straightforward. So let's go. Let's assume that we've got a simple server, HTTP server, which is which has only one handler, and this handler adds some values. Okay, so when we uh, hit the the, um, the server. And with the, the method slash add, we pass the vols, we should get such output. So let's do that, okay? And also the handler itself, okay? So uh, before we start, and uh, I'll show you the demo, here is the, the exactly the, the implementation of this handler. So we are getting the, um, the query arcs, the vols, splitting that by the comma, and then in the for, we are just adding that to the accumulator, and then uh, flashing everything to the response and uh, we've got the results and the sum of blah 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 the values then it's is that okay so uh, let's do that and uh, okay let's let's um, check it how we can do that and then we'll go to old way of debugging but let's start our application so here we've got this handler here we've got a main function as I've already shown you in the presentation and then we are showing the results, okay? So let's uh, hit some breakpoints and then just run it. I'm using the Visual Studio Code, but it's pretty straightforward to use any other ID. Okay, and then let's go to and hit the curl. Now we see that we can uh, check the values. Okay, let's continue. Checking the, the, the output. Here we can see that there is a Result, it's sum of uh, one to four, it's seven, of course, so everything is working, okay? But some time ago, uh, 
before the DELF, which is a debugger which I'm using, there was an old way of debugging. And the old way of debugging, which was told to me by my friend, was to just print everything to the output. Okay? So my friend, at the very beginning, when I started using Go in six years ago, uh, he told me that there is a no debugger. <laughs> in fact, it was, but it's not very common at those times. So he said to me he, that I should print everything to the screen. Yeah? And he said that that's what real hacker does. Yeah? So, so that was my first like, experience with debugging in Go a few years ago. But uh, we can do better. Yeah? So the very first thing is that we've got two options. The first one is the GDB. And the second one is DELF, as I mentioned already. So the DELF is the debugger which is written in Go. And it has uh, great support for a Go runtime. But uh, when I was preparing this presentation, then I uh, started with the GDB. So I said, OK, there are two debuggers. Let's show two of them. OK? Then I entered the web page, which is official uh, documentation from the Go creators. Then I read it, and there is a two nice sentence. OK? The very first thing is that the DELF is a better alternative. And the second, that GDB does not understand Go programs well. So I said, OK, let's, let's leave it. So let's focus on the DELF. How to do that in DELF? So what DELF is does, does under the hood? Um, it's a bit more complicated than uh, just running the, the you know, code and then attach and uh, uh, you know, go via the breakpoints or, or um, debug the flow. So the, the real and the true under the hood is that when we call the DELF debug and then our path, like a path to our application, under the hood, it compiles our program, but in not a regular way, but uh, in most most suitable. I will explain that later. Then uh, he executes this program and then attach uh, to this program and bega be begin to the debug session. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. The demo I show you that it's really easy to start the debugger here. Um, the very important thing that there is a configuration of that, but um, this one, the sorry guys, uh, the one which is called launch, it's like by default in ID. So if you've got a Go um, um, plugin in VS Code or in another ID, you've just got this configuration. It will allows you to debug the program. It's going to install Delph under the hood. So Visual Studio Code says that, OK, you need to install Delph first because we are doing Delph. OK, and you can do that uh, automatically and start debugging. Pretty easy. Uh, and as we can see, and as we saw in the previous example, it just works. Yeah, We can run it again. And we can, for example, check also here. We hit the breakpoint. We can, uh, of course, see the values. Nothing special. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, and then in the loop, we can calculate them. Yeah, pretty easy. Usually, Chrome does two requests. That's why we hit the breakpoint twice. In a, when we test it with the, with the curl, it does only one hit here. OK, we can continue. And ta-da. It's working, yeah. So really, really easy for a war warm up. Okay, let's go down. Uh, let's go uh, remote debugging. So it's when we have uh, some production server. I would like to attach to um, this debugger remotely. It's a bit more complex. So uh, what Go um, needs to do to be able to be debugged the program, uh, we need to build it with uh, some sp extra special flags. So if we call Delph and uh, run, then of course it's going to, to do that under the hood. Um, but in the Go 1.11, we started uh, the, the, you know, the whole um, dwarf things were com are compressed, so we need to pass extra flags to not compress them. So the binary is a bit, a bit bigger. There are um, some compiler optimizations are missing just to make it more and debugger friendly. Okay. And then we need to run applications, and then we can run another process, which will attach to this uh, to the speed, and then have a control over the the main uh, application. Okay, so that's what we need to do to be able to debug uh, Go programs remotely. Okay, let's uh, I guess let's let's do that. Okay, so now we I've got already prepared the version of 
uh, app Mac, which is our application is already built. So let's run it. Okay, we need to turn off the, the ports. Because they're the same. Okay, so let's run it again. Okay, it's working. Let's check whether it's working with curl. And now we need to attach. I'm using this also p grep, which is just getting the pit from the name of the application. Okay, so now we are running the delf. We are telling him to attach with the headless mode. Uh, just to not uh, um, run this application itself, but just to attach to the other one. And uh, some parameters like accept multi-client just to allow the reconnection. And then we can run it, okay? Now we see that it's working. We can hit the curl and this nothing is happening because by default, Delph is waiting for um, setting the breakpoints. Okay, so let's do that. So we are changing this launch to remote on localhost and this configuration is just this one. So we need to pass the directory where our application is and where are the files, the Go files, which can understand the application itself, okay? And then the port, uh, sorry, this is uh, remote on localhost, this, uh, this is workspace root. So this is the directory where, uh, where I run the Visual Studio code, okay? And then I'm passing the port on which Delphi is listening by default. Of course, this is this port which is where it's run, okay? And now, when we run it from Visual Studio Code, um, okay, let's debug that. Switch to remote on localhost, yeah, let's go, okay? And we see that this request from curl was, was in, the, in the idle state, so it was waiting for an application to, to go, and now we are just hit the breakpoint. Everything works like a charm, okay? Pretty easy, so let's go further, okay? Now let's have another thing, which is pretty common nowadays, just to try to debug Go applications, but in the Docker. So what might change? So to do that, we need to, uh, by default, the Docker uh, doesn't like uh, two processes run inside the container. By default, and I guess that's the best practice, is just to run um, process there. So we can use Delph, which uh, will have an extra um, method, which is called exec, which will when we pass the binary which we previously built so we we run this go build minus gc flux just to skip the optimization of the compiler and then we run delf but inside the container okay that's the whole magic which we need to do to um, remote uh, also debug the go code but inside the docker okay to do that we need to run the docker but it doesn't work and uh, why because by default, um, Docker uh, has security options, which uh, forking uh, the, the, the exec and the, the speed and getting access to, to the main process is uh, not allowed, okay? And to do that, we need to set extra options. So we need to pass this minus minus security opt second unconfined. And then Delph can run uh, Delph server and next, the Go applications then attach to this bit and control the flow of our application, okay? So, let's go, let's do that. So, I'm running this Docker. Okay, and again, this, um, this is, uh, sorry, the port is, of course. Okay, now I need to turn off the Delph and then hit the curl. Then it's escaped. As you can see, Delph is not the perfect, so it hangs sometimes. And then you need to hit the URL with the curl and hits the server. Then notice that the Delph is not working, and then he quits. But I will I will recap all that stuff at the very end. Okay, so let's run this Docker. And now let's try to attach to this to this Docker. Yeah, so I can show you also the configuration for that. Remote and Docker is here, so that's that's the part, okay? And the, the very important thing is that we need to pass the exactly directory by hand because uh, we cannot reuse this workspace route because it's a different path inside the container. So we need to pass the information inside the container where are, where is the application, what's the main.go file, just to make it possible to debug it, okay? And uh, so let's run it. 
okay let's remote on docker we can run the applications and we can hit the curl and we are there okay so pretty important thing is that this um we need to pass this extra flag okay to make the whole debugging in go possible um and i guess that's it about the debugging so um so let's uh i'm sorry uh, there's also one more thing about the debugging debugging also has uh, some extra thing which is called postmortem it's not very common but you can um also analyze the core file of the applications which will be printed when the application dies okay so sometimes application dies we don't know why it's too late for debugging but we can check some something with the debugger itself okay so we can get these core files uh, and we can dump the core files when the application exceeds and the crash somehow, okay? Uh, and this core file contains a memory dump of running process, okay? So how we can do that? We need to set extra flag which is called call go traceback set to crash, then run our application and then for example um, send a kill and then we'll have uh, the core dump printed in the by default somewhere in the in the um, uh, directory, I guess the local one, and also we can use the gcore to make the core file directly from the running application, and then we can run the call delf and say delf core and pass this application, but also pass the binary file just to be does just the debugger needs to understand what uh, what to debug and how the the, the, the structure of the application looks like. Okay, so uh, with uh, such thing we can. Uh, see the heap dump, the memory, also the allocations of some variables, but of course we cannot uh, set the breakpoints and so on. Okay, so that's how it works uh, in this uh, post-mortem debugging. So let's recap the whole debugging. So debugging in Go applications is very easy when we are running everything on a local host. Um, and attaching to production application, which are not non-Docker, is also pretty straightforward, but we need to remember about um, two things that it stops the execution of the entire app uh, when we start Delph. Okay, so when we start Delph, we cannot operate with this application. Okay, we need to hit the, we need to set the breakpoint, and then the application can can operate and and works. Okay, and also we have uh, we need to have these proper binaries built with extra flags, and uh, every single time when we escape the and uh, kills the session with the uh, from the Visual Studio Code or any, any other ID, uh, the bugging session, then we need to restart the server, which is also annoying. Okay, and in container, it's also problematic because, because of two things. That first of all is that we need to run container with unsecured way with this extra flags of security, and the second one is that uh, we need to create a dedicated container image with the Delph itself there. Okay, it's also not very um, very nice. So those are the problems, and even if our application uh, dies, it's not late, not too late for debugging. You can you can use these core files. Okay, let's now talk about the profiling. Profiling is I guess more fun. Uh, so what's profiling? Profiling is just a tool to analyze the complexity and the cost of Go programs. So we can analyze, for example, how many and where our application spends most of its time, and uh, where are the expensive, for example, calls, and what functions uh, are very expensive when it comes to the memory or CPU. Okay, so um, so there is also built-in tool in Go, which is called pprof, and this tool is uh, allows us to visualize those profiling and the profiling data, and we can profile the CPU, the heap, and also uh, more things like uh, block profiles and thread create and Go routine and mutex. And uh, everything, as I said, is built in, and also we can you can use it also in a code. Okay, so let's uh, let's have a look how we can run this profiling in Go. Okay, so the very first thing is through the benchmark. So we can run a benchmark, which is just testing um, one particular function, and we can set some extra flags like CPU profile or mem profile, and then our our profiling data would be automatically generated from from this running this benchmark. Okay, I will show you the example in a minute. You, we can use this blank import, also a uh, pretty nice thing, uh, I would say even neat, and I'll show the, the, the details in a moment. And of course we can, for a short-lived like applications, for example, uh, CLI, 
um, we can also uh, run this profiling and collect the profiling data also from the code. Yeah, so we can say s okay, start, and then stop profiling for for some time. Okay, so let's start with profiling with the import. Okay, so the only thing we've we've got a already server HTTP server which is running in the Go. We need to add this blank import. Okay, and this blank import by default will add extra. Uh, add extra handlers, HTTP handlers, to our application, which will, um, which allows us to uh, to run and to grab the profiling data from the server. Okay, so it's it's really nice. Uh, Google does that, for example, uh, for in every single production server, they've got also this profiling run, of course, on the different port for the security reasons, and then they are uh, generally constantly checking this profiling data. So they are, for example, in every hour, they are just collecting the profiling data um, and storing them somewhere in, in, uh, in the storage. And if some problems were, were appealed, then they are getting and trying to uh, fetch the data and run the p-profile, p -pro p and then analyze what was happened, okay? So they are doing that constantly just to make them even the, the data and the, the situations from the past uh, just they, they can you know analyze them even even later on okay so let's let's check this example in this example we are of course uh, setting and putting the blank import at the top and we have a two extra endpoints okay stats hello and hello okay the very first one is um, it has wrapper so it's going it's like called middleware in go so you can you wrap your uh, handler and then you run your um, your code, this hello uh, handler, which is just basically printing the hello word, and they are adding uh, some extra functionality to this handler, okay? And the stats are just printing the, the information about uh, the IP and uh, the session, for example, from what was the user agent and from which browser we uh, hit this page, okay? So um, if we have this import, uh, I guess I might cover most of the of the of the fact, but it's uh, very powerful, but also dangerous. So don't do that on the production on the same server, I would say, because if so, then the any anyone from the uh, from the you know um, from the world or uh, anyone from the um from the you know existing world can can hit your endpoints with the profiling and then collect the data or stop execution even and just to make a DDoS or uh, of also profiling degrades the degradates the performance so there is a plenty of security holes there so usually you're running two 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 servers inside this the application the first one is just run on the different port and then another is just ha handling all the um, all the you know requests from other applications or or end users, and the very first one is just uh, secured by some uh, you know security group or is not exposed in the Kubernetes or Docker or any other stuff. Okay, so there is a plenty of ways how to secure this, but of course we need to remember that. Okay, so here is an example how we can do that. We are running in the new Go routine, so it's like uh, another server, and we are serving all the uh, critical and p profiling on the different port than the main one, yeah. So the the p prof is run on this port one three three seven, which is here, and uh, you know the business logic of our application is run on a different one, and usually you are exposing just the second one, yeah, this one, um, like eighty eighty or something. Okay, so let's uh, have a look how to play with this pprof. Okay, so first of all, we need to make this uh, profiling. So um, we have the first very thing, very first thing is just to run the application. Um, the pprof endpoint is exposed, and then we need to from our terminal or from any other place, which is uh, also uh, possible to make this request. We can we can hit this with go tool pprof. And then we are passing the arguments minus seconds. So for how uh, how many seconds we are going to collect the data, and then run this, uh, uh, and it's going to download the data. I run this pprof uh, tool automatically. Okay. Um, then uh, of course we can have uh, two two ways of uh, playing with the pprof. One is the web one, and then there's also the terminal 
without this uh, minus HTTP flag, okay? And also we can even have a situation when we run the pprof at some point and then after some time we are running it uh, again just to check whether it's uh, better or not and then we can compare it and then we'll see whether we are our improvements in performance of our applications are good or not, okay? So let's go to the demo, okay? So, um, so here we've got uh, uh, our applications, so let's first run it. Okay, so now we are we have this uh, 1890 server, and now let's uh, let's try to check what is going on here. Okay, so if we hit this curl, we see that we are collecting extra informations. So the very first one is just information that um, from um, um, that um, stats hello endpoint was run on my host name, which is Mateusz MacBook Pro and no OS, no browser. So the user agent was not able to pass it. And because of that, uh, we, we are setting that the value to one, okay? So there are some defaults, so we are setting that to one. And also we are calculating the uh, how um, much of, how many of the microseconds took the whole handler to, to run the business logic, okay? So I run these applications with this minus minus print stats flag just to show you that we are collecting those informations, by, but, but to show you the uh, real um, performance of our applications, let's run it without that, okay? So now we have applications and instead of curl just hitting the endpoint stats hello, let's check uh, how many requests we can um, handle and what, what would be the average of uh, our web server, okay? So I use the tool which is called Hey. So now I can say, okay, run, um, run our application, uh, like attack our applications with this Hey tool for 10 seconds and send as many requests as possible to the endpoint slash hello, okay? This is the one which is fastest, which is not collecting the data, okay? And not collecting those extra, um, you know, information about the host name and so on. Okay, so it took, it will took ten seconds. Okay, now we see the result. Um, okay, here is information that we are able to handle forty more than uh, forty six k of requests per second. Okay, with our hello world endpoint. Okay, so let's now run the. Uh, the another one, the uh, the one with uh, uh, this um, no um, stats hello, okay. So just to check what's the difference between the the one which is also collecting this uh, extra information about the user agent and the one which is just plain returning the hello world text, okay. So let's run it for ten seconds. Come on. Okay, now we see that we've got uh, 40k. Okay, so we are slower by 6,000 uh, requests. Okay, so now let's try to use the pprof tool and analyze where our time is spent and how to improve um, our uh, stats handler to make it faster. Okay, so to do that, we need to run our applications again and collect the pprof data. So by default, we can uh, we can check what is under this uh, this endpoint even in the web browser without this pprof tool because it's pretty pretty nice. So what's there? Uh, we are now not collecting the profile in the real time, but now we are just uh, checking what we can what information we can get by default without running the without running the pprof um, from the uh, debugging endpoints. Uh, which are available here because of this blank import, okay? So here what is really important is, for example, heap. So here we can see all the uh, go routines and all the heaps from the go routines, which are not very important in that state, but at the very end they are um, really nice information and really inter interesting, I would say. For example, we can see the pose and s, okay? So pose and s are nothing else than the uh, the time which was spent on the GC, okay? So now we can have a look at this uh, array and, and check whether our GC is performing well or not and how much of the time was spent on the GC. Here are also information about the how many times was GC run. So if I refresh this page, we can see that, let's go, it's still 
800, but if I run any other traffic on our server, let's check it again, and now we can see it's 968. So just to see if it's not needed, then it's not working, but if there is a, a traffic to our server, then this GC is increasing, okay? Now it's one more than 1,000, okay? So we can have a look at some memory data from this heap. We can have a look at the number of Go routines, what, are, wh what they are currently doing in our applications. We can s check where are the allocations, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's uh, pretty nice, but it's not very, uh, that's I guess with this endpoint, by default, we cannot check why our endpoint with the stats is pretty slow, and we should um, use the pprof just to download and analyze the data, okay? So let's do that. So to do that, we need to first um, attack our server with some traffic, and in the meantime, run the pprof, okay? So let's do that, and now let's start the pprof, which is now collecting the data for five seconds. So it's going to check what is going on for this time. Okay, so it's terminal version, the first one, which I'm going to show you. So what's nice is that usually we can say, we can write top. Top is a really nice function in pprof, which will just uh, write 10 places where our um, where our uh, CPU was used for and was spent most of its time there, okay? It's nothing interested there from our perspective because those are mostly syscall and some runtime things, but there is nothing which we f um, write, yeah? So it's not uh, our code, okay? So um, I guess we need to improve it and so we can type top 25. And now we can see something really interested. And um, because now we can see that there is a my function, which was not this one, but this one, okay? So we can see that there is a with stats, okay? And this function was written by me. And we spent five seconds, so a lot, there. So this is a first place where we need to have a look, okay? And there is also another extra flag, which is called come, which is going to say, uh, which is going to collect not only the, the the single place where the time was spent, but also the all the um, functions which are called by this particular place. Okay, so now if I will call this uh, minus cumulative, then my function this with stats is going to be on the third place. So definitely this is a place where we need to have a look. But before that, let's uh, let's exit that and let's uh, show the another. Um, another way of showing that and let's run it on port uh, 1891 for example okay so again we are generating some traffic and then getting the uh, people of data okay five seconds we are collecting the data and then immediately we'll have a ui which is uh, open and this tool is built in in the go so this is nothing which you need to install uh, by yourself so why is why it's nice is that um, it shows you the, the tree uh, where your application spent most of the time and you can see that uh, this is a finishing request so it's like closing connection and sending the data to the wire nothing really interested from our, our perspective because usually you are using the by default HTTP server from Go so it's not like you know really smart heads are working to make it fast here is the same which is just reading the request. But here in the middle, there is a server handler, and this is something which was created by, by us, okay? Especially that handler func, which this, the handler function, which I've already wrote, okay? And here is with stats, and with stats is definitely something which I wrote. And here we can see that we spent almost five seconds there, yeah? And then we can have a look that this function called another function gets that stacks. And this function spends mm, uh, like 4.84 seconds there. Uh, but in fact, the most of its time was spent in here. Yeah, handlers get that stacks. And another, even uh, not in this particular function, but calling the os.hostname. So anyone knows why os hostname is so expensive? Okay, if not, then I can tell you that it's under the hood is making the syscall to the kernel, checking what's the host name, okay? And that's why it's so slow. So let's try to analyze it in a different view, okay? So this is a tree view, but there's also, oh, sorry, 
a flame graph. And this is like neat. So previously it was written by Uber. So Uber has its own implementing of, uh, of this flame graph, but now it's integrated and merged into the PPROF tool uh, built in Go. Okay, so here we can see what we can see. We can see that this is a read requesting. This is a finishing requesting, still nothi nothing which we can improve. But here is the serving. And here we can see that there is always host name. Just to be sure what does it mean. Uh, the wider block is the most of the time of our CPU is spent there. Okay, so we are looking for some wide, wide blocks. Okay, and here we can see that OS host name is like 25% of the whole execution of our application. So a lot. So we need to improve that. We'll do that in a second. But also, uh, what is what is important and uh, worth to notice is that the colors means nothing. Okay, so. Don't think that I whether if it's almost red or uh, or uh, orange, then it's it's uh, worse than yellow or uh, almost yellow. Okay, so it, it does nothing. So colors are just to make some difference between the blocks. Okay, and it's called fl flame graph, and it's pretty uh, common even in the different languages like uh, uh, JavaScript or or even Java. Um, so let's try to analyze this uh, this host name yeah so here we can see that after i'm i call the host name there are only syscalls and nothing very very important so let's try to go to the code and try to uh, make it faster okay so uh so okay so there was a with stats okay and with stats it's calling this get stats tax, and this is our um, a place where we need to have a look. And what is what it does when we are sending the request? It gets the request, and then we are collecting the user browser, the user OS, and also the endpoints, which is um, which is accessed from the external, and then we are collecting this OS hostname. But the truth is that I don't need to check this hostname every single time, because it 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 doesn't change very often. Yeah, I would even say that usually we we don't um, change it in the meantime. Okay, so load what we can do, we can remove it and set it to some global variable. Yeah, let's call it host, and we can say that it's going to be string, and let's call a function which will create in a in a second. Let's call it hostname. Okay. And now we can say that the host name is going to return a string and we will check this OS host name and make the syscall but only once. So we'll set it to the global variable which is going to be only called once, okay, at the very beginning of our application. So we can say that okay, if the error is equals nil, then we can return it. So we can return host. But otherwise if somehow syscall was was, uh, was broken and there are some errors then we can just return unknown okay and then here we need to add this extra information yeah so instead of setting it every single time we can say use host okay it should be reformatted automatically and okay so let's let's check whether we are improving or not okay so let's stop the pipref analysis, let's stop our server, let's run our server once again, and let's run our applications now without the profiling, okay? Let's have a look in the hey tool, which is just attacking our server, whether we are improving or not, whether we are faster than 40k, okay? Let's have a look. Now we are uh, not very much, I would say, it's 41 and a half, K requests per second, but uh, I can even run it once again because I guess we should do it better. It's, it's not much, 1.5 thousand. So let's try again. Um, uh, again, 41, not much. But let's let's check how um, our flame graph will look like in the PPROF after our improvement. Okay, so we are attacking our server one more time and we are collecting the profiling data one more time again. Okay, let's do that. Okay, and we can see that, let's go to the flame graph. And now you can see that we've got the re uh, request finisher, which took most of the time, a request reader, which is took another lots of time. And now there's also, also the runtime stuff, which are not very 
um, there is also not the place where we can improve. But here we can see that this is also not our handler. But here, I guess, where is that? I guess it's it's maybe it's on the left. Yeah, it's there. Okay, so you can see that I improved a lot because previously it took like one one I don't know it was like a twenty percent or twenty five percent of the whole invocation. Now it's just like five percent, so it's extremely fast. And now we can see that there is uh, with stats, yeah, and of course we can. Uh, um, have a look and try to parse this user agent and make it faster. Of course, we can make some further analysis, but to be honest, uh, I'm not going to show you, but I hopefully in this example you can show how easily with the flame graph and pprof tool you can find a bottleneck, find a place where your CPU spends most of its time and uh, make your uh, whole application faster. Okay? So, Let's get back to the presentation, okay? So we can also do the profiling and generating the profiling data from the test or a benchmark, okay? So how to do that? We can have a function, for example, which is, which is calculating the Fibonacci. Then we, we might uh, write the benchmark. In Go benchmark, uh, you are writing just by adding the benchmark um, at the very beginning in a test file and then running in, in some, some time, okay? For some time, usually you're doing that in the for loop and uh, the n needs to be smaller than b dot n, which is the number which is generated by Go, and it's going to be like 1, 10, 100, 1,000, and so on, until for some time. So benchmark is usually run for like a few seconds, okay? Mm. So that's how the benchmark are, uh, are created in a Go. And then what is really important is just when you're writing to this, uh, this benchmark, you need to pass this extra minus bench just to run the benchmark, uh, only benchmarks from the test file, and then uh, add the CPU pr profile information, which will just uh, create the CPU profiling. And then you need to, of course, run our tool, which is called pprof, and then pass this uh, profiling uh, file. Okay, and then it's going to open your. Um, your uh, web browser or terminal version of uh, pprof just to analyze what's what's going on, okay? And really nice also the mem profiler. Um, I'm not going to show you, but it's really nice because it also uh, shows you the um, uh, the place where your function allocates m like most of the memory, okay? And also you can run the benchmark and pass extra flag that show mem, and then you will see how many allocations your function does okay it's a really killer feature if you would like to have um, a fast uh, hot path uh, usually in your applications because if something is not allocating much then gc is not run sometimes uh, um, like it's it's run only sometimes not very often so it's it's really good cool for for a performance of your application so usually you are not only um, providing the cpu data but also the memory data just to find out the allocations and get rid of them because there are some techniques in a go how to do that okay the manual way how we can collect the profiling data we can on, we can just create the files so like pprof man pprof cpu of course close them at the very end defer does just to uh, call these functions uh, when this function is going to be to be closed okay so so defer will just move the cpu file at the very end of this function and then we can start cpu profiling for example, run some leaky functions, wait some time just to collect the data and write heap profile and start CPU profile, okay? That's it. Uh, that's how we can do that uh, in the manual way. And let's have some recap about the profiling, okay? So uh, I, I'd say that Golan creators and maintainers did a great job with profiling. It's really, really nice and um, convenient way to, to find and optimize your code, okay? And the blank import is very important, but it's very nice, but dangerous and uh, it makes your applications insecure, and please write and expose the debug information on different ports, okay? And uh, if you will, with the flame graph, if you will see what's your problem and where your application spends most of its time, then please write a benchmark just to test this particular function, and this is the easiest way to find out the bottlenecks and improve the speed of your application. So not collecting the data and run like end-to-end -end tests, but just to isolate the problem and then try to fix it. And of course, you use flame graph. This is the easiest way to find out. And then I guess the, the visualization is pretty nice. Uh, and of course, web-based 
pprof is better than the terminal one, and please don't prematurely optimize, of course, as always and as in every single presentation about the profiling and making your application faster. Okay, so now let's talk about the tracing. So tracing is nice, and tracing in a Go, um, it's also extra tool which is built in, it's called Go Tool Trace, and it allows you to capture some really nice events from your uh, system, and those events are I would say um, really, really uh, nice, but it uh, it's not like that. That if you try to op like try to find out the best way to make your application faster is just to start with trace. Start start with usually with the pprof, and uh, try to use different kind of problems with the tracing and goal tracing. Okay, for example, the GC or uh, kind of uh, locks which might be uh, blocked your goal routines. But let's see. Okay, so uh, trace go tool trace is just a tool for visualization as pprof, and uh, also uh, it's really powerful. It's also built in, and you can uh, have a view at this trace. So we will we'll see that in a minute in the demo that you can uh, have a look and uh, and analyze the tracing data with that. You can make uh, the go routine analysis, how many of them is, what uh, they are doing, how what the syscalls are. In the inside the Go routines, uh, really uh, low-level stuff. Also the network and the sys and syscalls as well, and uh, the scheduler things. So this is uh, pretty nice when you would like to have a have a and just get the knowledge why your Go routine waits for another or uh, whether under the hood in the runtime some some for example Go routine is waiting for something which uh, is not uh, happening. Okay, and there's uh, some kind of starvation. Okay, so of course. It's the same package, um, and we don't need to add any extra thing in our server just to collect the tracing data. But uh, what problems we can solve with that? So uh, latency problems, um, poor parallelism. So if we've got, for example, worker um, pattern, and we have uh, like tons of uh, workers, and now we can notice with this tool that, for example, uh, half of the workers are, are in the idle state and they are just waiting for something and it's not happening. And um, we can we can do that better way. Okay, and also log contention we can we can also track that with with this tool. Okay, so when the go tool trace is not appropriate, so uh, when we would like to have a knowledge which function is slow, then use the pprof. For example, when we would like to know which uh, function spent uh, and, and uses CPU a lot, also it's not the best tool, then use the pprof, okay? So how we can start with tracing, how we can collect the data? Uh, almost the same way as a pprof, okay? So with the benchmark, minus trace flag, uh, blank import, as I mentioned, and also we can do that by hand by calling trace.start inside our um, Go program, okay? So let's go with this test and benchmarks. Again, example with the Fibonacci, Benchmark, nothing changed comparing to the pprof, but running this test, we need to add extra flag, not minus profile, but minus trace, okay? And then collecting the data, and then just analyze this trace, okay? With the import, same stuff, exactly same thing. And we can see and have a look that this is a blank import, of course. How to do that? We need to, the difference is that now that we, with the Go um, trace tool, tool trace, we don't um, automatically fetch this data, but we need to first download it and then run tool trace just to get it and analyze it, okay? So, like, it's not the one step, just we need to only run this, um, run this Go tool, like with the pprof, that we are running pprof and he's going to f download that and analyze, but the first we need to download it and then start this tool. Okay, and there is only web-based, so there is a node this uh, terminal one. And the manual way, uh, as you can imagine, we need to create a file, close it at the end, and start the tracing, and then trace, stop, call it at the very end. So really, really almost exact uh, same thing like the with the pprof. So let's have a have a demo of that. Okay. So now we've got application, uh, and our application is. Uh, is uh, again, uh, so we can uh, maybe not spoil. So let's go run our main application, okay, without any stats. Again, our port is busy, okay, turn it off, turn it off, okay. Uh, run it again. Now we've got application, 
and now we can have a look with the with the curl what it does okay so only the paper of stuff hello okay and we see that we've got some information that our endpoint was visited n times okay so that's the difference here and uh, now let's have a look what performance we can get from this particular endpoint okay so let's run again this uh, hey tool for 10 seconds and let's um i'm sorry it's hello world so let's run it for 10 seconds mm. let's see how many requests per seconds we can get let's check it 83 as we can see we are you know it's like heavy operation uh, this time so let's try to analyze that with the um our uh, trace tool okay so again exactly same situation now i need to run the workload run and attack our server in the meantime i will download the data and then run uh, pproof to analyze that okay so now i'm attacking the server now i'm downloading the data okay and now i can set go to trace set one dot trace okay let's run it let's make it bigger now we can have uh, some some functions which we can have a look we can uh, check what um, what what's the go routine analysis we can have a uh, view the trace itself and also we can um, have a look at some some kind of schedule scheduler latency profiles why it's important because golang is not using the threads from the os but it's using the threads from the OS, but it has another scheduler which is on top of the of that, and then is going to um, uh, operate on the Go routines. Yeah, so the Go routines is run on this uh, uh, thread from the OS, but it has like another scheduler. So it's not using the system scheduler, but it it uses the system scheduler, but just to get the thread or thread uh, from the OS, but then is going to also run its Go routines on this part particular with its own scheduler. Okay. But let's start with this view trace, okay? And let's analyze that. So now we can see that we've got something. And what is really nice here, or what is not, is that we've got only one processor. But the fact is that my application, my, my computer has like eight cores, or four cores and like eight. Um, uh, but it should uh, show shown hit it uh, like eight things. So now we can see that like seven other cores are, are in the idle mode, okay? Why is that? You know, maybe some Go experts which can answer that? No? Because there is some extra environment variable in Go, which is called uh, uh, which is called Go Max Pros. And with that extra variable, we can limit the number of processors uh, and the cores which are used by the Go program, okay? So with that, I limited that to one. And because of that, we can see that only one processor was doing anything and the rest was not even touched by our Go program, okay? So so that kind of problems you can solve with this tracing tool, okay? So for example, poor parallelism, not used all the cores. Uh, some cores might be uh, in the idle modes and, and also the gaps which are because of the waiting, but let's Let's improve it, okay? Let's set it to nine. Run our application. Go run main dot go again. Okay. Now let's attack our server one more time. And let's call this curl and download it to trace number two. Okay. And then go to trace, but the two. Let's run it. Okay, now let's view the trace. And we can see that it's much better. Now we are using four, but only four, not eight. Okay. Still, we can see that the uh, the numbers are not very good. So you, you guess it. If I'll have only four calls, it should be three, but it's five. So it means that I get eight. If I get eight, then why the rest is not doing anything? Okay. So the truth is that some some dumbass sets in this data main go sleep, and because of this sleep, we are waiting and the 
the fact is how the uh, Golang scheduler is working is that the, there was not that amount of work which can be split into eight, um, eight cores. So there was only work for four. Okay, so if we remove it and try it and run it one more time, okay, then attack our server, then collect the trace with number three. Okay, then call this tool but analyze the trace number three. Then we can see that it took lots of time by splitting. Why is that? And now we can analyze the trace, but not everything in once, but we need to it's split it into three. And the truth is that PPROF is just getting the snapshot of, of our system in some with some uh, with some time, yeah. So, for example, every single 10 milliseconds, we are making snapshot, and the data uh, and the number and the amount of data for uh, for example the PPROF is pretty small. But in the trace, we are collecting all the events. Okay, so every single invocation, syscall, anything, is dumped to the file. Okay, and because of that, our trace data is huge. Okay, so let's try to analyze whether all our uh, cores were utilized, okay? And we can see that yes, okay? From zero to seven, it's eight, okay? So now we can see that our program was, was utilizing the CPU almost at max, okay? There are still some things which we, which we might analyze with this tool. If we'll try to dig in very, very deeply, we can, for example, have a look exactly in every single syscall, every single function invocation in a go and have a look what was going on there. Let's try to click it and then we can see what was the wall duration, when it was start, sorry, started and uh, what was doing and so on and so forth. So it's like really, really low level, very interesting stuff, especially when you would like to track the poor parallelism, okay? When you would like to track that not every single CPU is used, uh, and uh, it's like plenty of, of low level stuff which you can uh, find with this trace tool, especially uh, when you have a lock contention, for example, and uh, there are multiple go routines which are waiting for uh, on the, on the uh, for example, mutex. So that kind of two problems you can solve with this with this trace, okay? And let's recap the, the whole presentations. So we start from the debugger, and then it's it's the truth that Delph is still missing some future features. I would say that Delph should be uh, built in in the Go, and I would say that this uh, as a pprof, as a tracing, also the debugger should be built in and uh, just maintained by the core Golang people. And uh, with that, for example, f uh, feature like um, like uh, uh, you know continuing the application when we are start the server should be like built in and uh, the hanging problems there are plenty of some missing stuff in the Delph uh, debugger that should be improved and I the, the the work is done and lots of improvements are there but still some are missing yeah so so I guess maybe there would be some some kind of movement that they they are going to. Um, somehow take it from the from the uh, Derek Parker, which is a great guy, and he he built it, uh, and just to to make it a built-in uh, debugger. Okay, then uh, debugging Dockerize applications is a bit problematic. So remember about this um, insecure running and that stuff. And also, please remember that even if your application died, it's still not um, not that late, and you can still debug some and and check the memory. And uh, about the profiling. So profiling is really easy. I would highly recommend to everyone that. And please remember that uh, this blank import is powerful but problematic, so hide it, especially on the production servers. And uh, usually if you will, with the flame graph of course, you will find out which function is slow, then use and write a benchmark just to analyze and, and find out and make it really, really fast and improve it with the benchmark, it's the easiest way. And of course, if you have uh, problems with the locks, GC, poor parallelism, use the tracer tool, it's really cool. And thank you, that's it. <laughs>